Walser. I'm a professor of history at UC University, and it's my honor and pleasure this evening to introduce our guest. Before I do that, I would like to take a moment to thank uh, those who have made this evening possible, and the, indeed the events of this week possible. Uh, the Office of the Associate Vice President for Diversity has given unstinting support for our activities from the beginning. And this tradition continues under the able leadership of Dr. Karen Days. Other organizations which have provided help include the Tanner Humanity Center, the United Jewish Federation of Utah, Salt Lake Jewish Community Center, the J. Willard Marriott Library, and the Department of History. And we are grateful to all of them. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Professor John Roth, Russell K. Pitzer, Professor of Philosophy at Claremont McKenna College. Professor Roth earned his bachelor's degree at Pomona College, his master's and doctorate in philosophy at Yale University. And by the way, our speakers in the past have all been historians, and uh, it's, it's good this time to have a philosopher. Uh, Professor Roth has authored, co-authored, and edited more than 30 books and hundreds of articles. Uh, his books include A Consuming Fire, Encounters with Elie Wiesel and the Holocaust, Approaches to Auschwitz, the Holocaust and its Legacy, Holocaust, Religious and Philosophical Implications, Different Voices, Women and the Holocaust, Private Needs, Public Selves, Talk About Religion in America, Ethics After the Holocaust, and Holocaust Politics. In addition to his very impressive publication record, Professor Roth has built a substantial record of service as well. He is a member of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Council. He's a former chair of the California Council for the Humanities. He's vice chair of Remembering for the Future, a general editor uh, for a Greenwood Press series on Christianity and the Holocaust, and a member of editorial boards of, a numer of numerous journals. He's been a visiting professor at a number of universities, including Haifa and Doshisha, Japan, and has received uh, the uh, Doctorate in Humane Letters from four universities. Alongside his other professional activities, Professor Roth has excelled in teaching as well. In 1987, he received the first Claremont McKenna College President's Award in 1995, the G. David Huntoon Senior Teaching Award, and three times his colleagues have voted him the recipient of the Crocker Award for Excellence. I could continue, but you have come tonight to hear the keynote address and not me, and so please join me in welcoming Professor John Roth, whose theme tonight is the Holocaust and the Christian world. to thank Professor Smeltzer for his kind introduction and uh, his hospitality. Also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Dace and uh, Leo Leckie, who works in her office, for their kindness in arranging my visit here today. Uh, earlier this week in Claremont, we had a similar kind of observance, and uh, Ron, it fell to me to be the host on that occasion, so I'm aware that it takes a lot of extra work and effort to put these programs together, and I'm very grateful to you for your kindness. My topic, uh, as Professor Smelser indicated, is the Holocaust and the Christian world. When I was um, asked by one of the people who writes for the university newspaper, why are you talking about that topic? I, I stopped for a minute because it uh, caught, me, caught me back a bit. And I said, well, I think it was because I was asked in some ways to address this topic. And the reason I was asked probably is because I have an interest in this, both personal and professional, as you'll hear as, as we go here. I think this is an important uh, aspect of uh, Holocaust memory and commemoration, and it contains, I think, uh, some insights that may pertain for, for other traditions uh, as well, which perhaps we can explore in the uh, Q&A period after the talk. I have a kind of epigraph or a brief uh, quotation that I would uh, 
mentioned at the beginning. It comes from Elie Wiesel, who is a Holocaust survivor as a teenager. As many of you know, I'm sure he was in Auschwitz. Uh, liberated from Buchenwald, uh, came to the United States, uh, has become a very important writer and humanitarian and a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. On one occasion, he uttered very simple words, which I'll refer to a time or two in my talk. He says, if we stop remembering, we stop being. The day stops when the sirens scream. Two minutes later, an Israeli morning goes on as usual, but not entirely. It is Yom HaShoah, the spring day that commemorates the Holocaust. As we commemorate the Holocaust in 2002, it is worth remembering that the scream of the Israeli sirens is a warning that produces awesome silence. Perhaps this year especially, the sirens and the silence, which belong together, should make us think about the Holocaust in today's world, and in particular in relation to what we can call the Christian world, that part of human experience and history that has been so decisively influenced by that tradition's teaching and power. Thinking about the Holocaust in today's world raises many questions because doing so is now a post 20th century task, one that takes place after September 11th, 2001, one that takes place as violence between Israelis and Palestinians has escalated in the season of Passover and Easter, one that must be carried out in a world that has repeatedly experienced mass murder, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. Given all that has happened after Auschwitz, especially the wasting of human life that continues to accumulate, why remember the Holocaust? What good can that do? What difference would it make if nobody remembered the Holocaust anymore? To respond to those general questions and to prepare for our thinking about them in relation to the Christian world as I have defined it, note that Raoul Hilberg, one of the world's preeminent Holocaust scholars, estimates conservatively that Nazi Germany destroyed about 2.7 million Jews in 1942 alone, which made that year the most lethal in Jewish history. That recollection, in turn, can lead one to consider how this disaster came to be, and thus how one thing may lead to or follow from another in immensely destructive ways. As one encounters those historical details, awareness builds that the Holocaust was morally wrong or nothing ever could be. That awareness, in turn, can sensitize the conscience of individuals and help to make them more humanely conscientious than they would otherwise be. If we stop remembering, the Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel has said, we stop being. No tradition emphasizes memory more than the Jewish tradition from which Elie Wiesel comes. That fact helps to explain why one of his novels, it's called The Forgotten, focuses on the struggle of a Holocaust survivor who strives to transmit his story before the devastation of Alzheimer's disease takes its irreversible toll upon his memories. Especially as we age, we can understand Wiesel's point in our personal lives. We dread memory loss. It means an enfeebled life. And at the end of the day, there is definitely a sense in which we stop existing when we can no longer remember. The loss of Holocaust memory threatens the very existence of human society. 
That loss would leave us bereft of much needed warnings about the destructive power of blindness, arrogance, hatred, and dogmatic convictions that we are right and everyone else is wrong. The existence of memory, however, is not enough. Memory alone is insufficient for our needs. Everything depends on having good memory. Good memory depends on vivid recollection and on lucid connection. It requires recalling details with candor, documenting what is recalled, and discerning patterns of action with honesty. But good memory goes beyond those essential qualities too. It involves questions, not only about what we remember, but also about how we remember, what we do with what we remember, whether we turn memory into something that hurts or something that heals. Commemoration of the Holocaust aims, I think, to give us good memories. But that claim still entails a paradox that calls for explanation. Of course, I do not mean that the content of those memories is good. With the exception of the cases of rescue that were too few and far between, most of the content of Holocaust-related memories is bereft of goodness. What I do mean is that as we learn about and from the Holocaust, our memories will become good in the sense that they will not let us forget what is most important. At least in part, this may have been what Edward Bond, a British poet moved by the Holocaust, had in mind when he wrote a poem called How We See. Here's how it sounds. After Treblinka and the Special Commando who tore a child with bare hands before its mother in Warsaw, we see differently. Men taken from workshops and farms to fight for Kaiser and King lived in a world asleep in mist. The Special Commando lived in a world of electric lights, cinemas, planes, and radios. We see racist slogans chalked on walls differently. We see walls differently. The Holocaust can and should make us see differently. Pope John Paul II helped to show the truth of that claim for the post-Holocaust Christian world when he visited Israel in late March of the year 2000. At Yad Vashem, Israel's memorial to the Holocaust, the Pope's humble silence conveyed heartfelt grief and repentance for Christianity's anti-Jewish traditions, which assisted the persecution and murder of nearly six million Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators. Hours before he departed Jerusalem for Rome, the Pope's silence again spoke volumes when he went to Judaism, Judaism's most holy site, the sacred Western Wall, which is all that remains of the Second Temple, destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. There the Pope followed ancient tradition by quietly placing a written prayer in one of the wall's cracked stones. Importantly, the Pope's prayer asked God's forgiveness for Jewish suffering caused by Christians. Perhaps even more than those words, the Pope's silent presence spoke powerfully as he stood at that place and reached out to touch the wall with humility. Sometimes silence says the most but it can do so in the most profound ways, only when we also take time to speak about what we remember. Remembering the Holocaust must break silence, as well as making a place for silence. Thus, it may be helpful to reflect on other walls, ones that are related to, but different from, the walls at Yad Vashem, or the Western Wall of the ancient Jewish temple in Jerusalem. At the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., 
biblical words from the prophet Isaiah that say, you are my witnesses, are inscribed on a wall where it is difficult for visitors to miss them. Whenever I visit the museum, I stop for a moment to read that ancient text, You Are My Witnesses, which expresses an expectation, a commandment, and a fact all at once. Those simple but immensely challenging words make me think about my Christian identity. Specifically, Isaiah's words require me to reflect on Christianity's relation to the Holocaust, Nazi Germany's attempt to destroy the European Jews, and to wrestle with the implications of that event for my religious tradition. Most of my academic life has been devoted to studying the Holocaust as things have turned out. Frequently, I am asked how I came, how I became involved in that work, which has been my passion for more than 25 years. Sometimes people ask, are you Jewish? Perhaps assuming, mistakenly, that dedicated attention to Holocaust history is something that only Jews are likely to pursue. To the question, are you Jewish? I would be glad and proud to answer yes, but my identity is different. I have immersed myself in a study of the Holocaust, or the Shoah as it is called in Hebrew, because my Christian identity, indeed I believe anyone's identity as a Christian, is linked to that catastrophe. As I explain what I mean, I also want to suggest how we Christians might re-identify ourselves in a post-Holocaust situation and how we might do so in ways that would give our tradition greater integrity, an integrity that, de that depends in so many ways on solidarity with Jewish tradition, with Israel, and with the Jewish people. To develop those ideas, follow with me, if you can, in your mind, from the entry hall in the Holocaust Museum, where Isaiah's words are inscribed, to a smaller but even more solemn place within the museum, a circular space, which maybe some of you have seen or been in, called the Hall of Remembrance. The names of places can be found around the perimeter of this hall. Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Majdanek, three of the Nazi killing centers on Polish soil where Jews were gassed, are among them. The Hall of Remembrance also includes places for memorial candles to be lit. They honor the six million Jewish children, women, and men who were killed one by one in camps of death and destruction. Opposite the entry of the circular hall of remembrance, an eternal flame burns where soil from camps in Poland, Germany, and other countries has been deposited. Biblical words appear on the circular walls of the hall of remembrance. Shared by Jews and Christians, the three passages from the Hebrew Bible can be read in different sequences, depending on how one's eyes follow the ark that contains them. Consider those three passages. One comes from Genesis, the other two from the book of Deuteronomy in the Hebrew Bible. Consider these passages as guideposts for deepening our thinking about identity, integrity, and being a witness especially as those ideas relate to post-Holocaust Christian life. The first biblical quotation says this, And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Those words remind us that witnesses are those who have seen or heard something. They are people who are called to testify. They furnish evidence. 
Often they sign their names to documents to certify an event's occurrence or a statement's truth. So when one reads that verse from the Genesis story of Cain and Abel, the story of the first murder, God's question calls for testimony and for bearing witness. A Christian who contemplates those words, what have you done, in that museum setting, must do some soul searching about identity and integrity. For the Holocaust's history testifies to a disturbing fact, namely, that while Christianity was not a sufficient condition for the Holocaust, Christianity was a necessary condition for the actual disaster that took place. That statement does not mean that Christianity caused the Holocaust. Nevertheless, apart from Christianity, the Shoah is scarcely imaginable because Nazi Germany's targeting cannot be explained apart from the anti-Jewish images, Christ killer, willful blasphemers, unrepentant sons and daughters of the devil, to name only a few, that have been deeply rooted in Christian practices. Existing centuries before Nazism, Christianity's negative images of Jews and Judaism, supported by the institutions and social relationships that promoted those stereotypes, played key parts in bolstering the racial and genocidal anti-Semitism of Adolf Hitler and his Third Reich. There can be no credible doubt about it. Christianity's anti-Jewish elements provided essential background, preparation, and motivation for the Holocaust that happened when Germans and their collaborators carried out the final solution of the so-called Jewish question. What have you done? God's question to Cain challenges post-Holocaust Christians, too. The second biblical quotation in the Hall of Remembrance at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum says this, keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart, recite them to your children, and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Those words from the Hebrew Bible are inscribed above the eternal flame that burns in the Hall of Remembrance near the spot where soil from the Nazi death camps has been deposited. In that place, standing before those words can and should make deep impressions upon a Christian. Those impressions involve, once again, identity, integrity, and being a witness. The words inscribed from Deuteronomy are calls to remember. Such calls are crucial because the Jewish saying is true when it proclaims that in memory lies the redemption of the world. That outlook, of course, is not referring to just any kind of memory. In this case, memory should lead to repentance, to what the Jewish tradition calls teshuvah, a return to God and to a right path. To explain further what I mean, I want to acknowledge two feelings that are important for both Christians and Jews to grasp. First, some contemporary Christians, those of us who live in the United States, for example, may wonder why we need to remember Christianity's role in the Holocaust. That involvement, it might be argued, took place long ago and far away. It was part of Europe's old world corruption. In our country, we 21st century Americans may be tempted to say, things have been different. We made a new beginning, breaking away from fallen European ways. The Holocaust, this view might go on to say, was not could not have been any responsibility of ours, especially if, like you 
or me, we live in Utah or California, which is about as far away from Auschwitz as one can get in the United States. Fortunately, I would say, history will not let such shallow analysis stand. In the 21st century, very few people anywhere, American or not, would be among the two, uh, two billion Christians in the world today if it were not for a centuries-old Christian tradition whose history includes Holocaust-related hostility to Jews and Judaism, even if many Christians are not as aware of this fact as we ought to be. Remembering can be hard, often painful work, but it can also remind us of other qualities. So the second point is that remembering can take us post-Holocaust Christians back to our roots in ways that remind us about who we are and about who we ought to be when we are at our best. Here I can clarify my meaning by emphasizing that I was drawn to study the Holocaust more and more because of a collision between two features of my experience. On the one hand, I have personally experienced Christianity as something basically good. On the other hand, I know that Christianity, my tradition, has not been good to or for everyone. The Holocaust bears witness to that. I found myself wanting to know where things had gone wrong, especially insofar as Christians and Jews were concerned. In the process of self-definition, I discovered, Christians had lost sight of their close and essential ties to Jewish tradition. How different history would have been if that result had not happened. How much better the world would be even now if those gaps could be closed. These feelings take me back to the words from Deuteronomy that are inscribed above the eternal flame in the Hall of Remembrance at the museum in Washington, D.C. The commandment to remember contained in the words from Deuteronomy refers to other words that say this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your might. When the Christian New Testament reports that Jesus was asked which commandment was the first of all, he gave those words from Deuteronomy in reply, adding in true Jewish fashion that the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Then when Jesus was asked to define who is one's neighbor, he told the parable of the Good Samaritan, which summarizes about as well as any part of Christian scripture what it ought to mean to be a Christian. The key point here, however, is that we Christians have our identity because the workings of history put before us a relationship with God that can be understood neither apart from Jewish history, nor, and this is very important, apart from the ongoing vitality of Jewish life. We Christians came to know God through the Jewish tradition as Jesus and his followers made that tradition accessible to us and grafted us into it. As time passed, changes distorted those connections and tragically, the full price of those distortions would not be known until the Holocaust scarred the earth. Nevertheless, the basic point was there to be recognized all along if Christians are essentially the followers of Jesus, a faithful Jew, then our responsibility is to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. As we Christians interpret the identity of Jesus, the bottom line comes back to those words from Deuteronomy that are inscribed above the eternal flame in the Hall of Remembrance, including the way in which they point to God. Christian re-identification after the Holocaust, I believe, can lead to a deepened integrity for Christian life just to the extent that there is a Christian turning, a returning to a love 
of our rootedness in Jewish tradition. This returning should underscore an awareness that Jews are not indebted to Christians as we are to them. As Clark Williamson, a thoughtful Christian thinker, has put it, we Christians should think of ourselves as guests in the house of Israel and behave accordingly. As one's eyes follow the Hall of Remembrance's arc from left to right, from words that question, what have you done, to words underscored by an eternal flame that encourage one to remember, a third inscription requires attention as well. Its words, attributed to Moses, say this, I have set before you life and death. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Several years ago, it was actually on April 7th, 1994 to be exact, Pope John Paul II hosted a special concert at the Vatican. The concert was held to commemorate the Holocaust. It was a night of firsts, which was not entirely a cause for celebration because the firsts were so late in coming. For example, on that occasion, the chief rabbi of Rome was invited for the first time to co-officiate at a public function in the Vatican. For the first time, a Jewish cantor sang in the Vatican. For the first time, a 500-year-old Vatican choir sang a Hebrew text in performance. Late though these firsts turned out to be, the music at the Vatican's interfaith concert was moving and the Pope's concluding words went to the heart of the matter when he asked the concert's listeners to observe silence and to hear once more, as he put it, the plea, do not forget us, a plea rising from the Holocaust victims, the dead and the living. Rightly, John Paul II described that plea as powerful, agonizing, heart-rending, the Pope's remarks also suggested that no memory can be worthy of that plea unless remembering leads people to check what he called the specter of racism, exclusion, alienation, slavery, and xenophobia, and to act, as he went on to put it, so that evil does not prevail over good, as it did for millions of Jews during the Holocaust. The papal concert closed with Leonard Bernstein's Chichester Psalms. Sung on that occasion by a Vatican choir, the Hebrew text included these words from Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. The music, the Pope's words, and particularly the Chichester Psalms accented a very important point the value of beliefs, Christian or Jewish, must be measured by the justice or injustice, the good or evil that they inspire. The Holocaust was unjust and evil or nothing ever could be. At least in part, the value of specifically Christian beliefs needs to be tested by their contributions to the Holocaust. Such a test leaves Christianity wanting in ways that should make my religious tradition much less triumphal than it has been in the past. Far from being an occasion for regret, however, such changes ought to be welcomed because they reflect needed honesty and candor, and they could encourage atoning work that protests against injustice and that tries its best to protect those who become evil's prey. In the 51st Psalm, another text that Jews and Christians share, we find these words, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The acceptable sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, 
you will not despise. The post-Holocaust condition that is most necessary for us Christians is a spiritual and ethical turning, a soul-searching, personal and communal, that asks, that leads us to ask, what should it mean for me, for us, to be Christian after Auschwitz? Responses to that question will still take time to form. Just to the extent that they are formed well, I believe, will Christianity have the identity and integrity that it ought to have. Those responses, I also believe, will be formed well just to the extent that they focus on three points. First, the question that asks, what have you done? Second, the necessity to remember that Christians are the followers of a Jew named Jesus. And third, the responsibility to choose life. Doing those things will help us post-Holocaust Christians to respond authentically to the charge from Isaiah's text, you are my witnesses, by saying, yes, we are your witnesses indeed. Only to the extent that we post-Holocaust Christians make that response an honest one will our identity and integrity become what it ought to be. It is painful to remember the Holocaust. How could it not be? So quickly and in such devastating ways, the Holocaust swept away good things, families, homes, rights, good things so basic that every person needs them and yet that are too often taken utterly for granted. Why remember the Holocaust in today's world? For me, the bottom line answer to that question is simply this. No event does more than the Holocaust to make me remember to take nothing for granted. The Holocaust showed that the integrity of the Christian tradition must not be taken for granted and that the restoration of that integrity depends tremendously on what Christians say and do in the aftermath. One thing that Christians must urge and do in that aftermath, I believe, is to help ensure that the Christian-Jewish reconciliation reflected in Pope John Paul II's recent visit to Israel continues with the timely opening of the Vatican archives that contain the as yet undisclosed documents concerning the controversial reign of Pope Pius XII during the Nazi period. Just as Jews want to know what the Vatican's Holocaust-related archives contain, we post-Holocaust Christians, Protestants, and Latter-day Saints, no less than Roman Catholics, must have awareness of those records too. The Holocaust will always keep Christians and Jews at some distance. But the degree of reconciliation that can be achieved in spite of the Holocaust will be less than it might be until those archives are opened fully to the best historical scholarship that human intelligence can muster. The opening of those archives, of course, may not make reconciliation easier for much depends on what they contain. But only when the archives are opened will we have a fuller basis for an honest Christian Jewish understanding, however incomplete it must remain, that a post-Holocaust world still badly needs. The Holocaust survivor Primo Levi concluded one of his last books, The Drowned and the Saved, by contending, as he put it, that there are no problems that cannot be solved around a table, provided there is goodwill and reciprocal trust. If there is to be increasing post-Holocaust reconciliation between Christians and Jews, which would be a very good thing, it will require courage that refuses to let skepticism dismiss the hopes of Levy too easily. The Vatican's opening of its Holocaust-related archives remains a decisive step to counter that skepticism. Memory about the Holocaust 
should and does make us grieve. We mourn because we know that life is precious and because it can be so very good. The sorrow that the Holocaust unavoidably produces is intensified because we understand that the devastation of Auschwitz and Treblinka took place in a world that can have incredible, awesome beauty. Thoughts such as those occupied my mind on September 10th, 2001, when I addressed the first year class at Claremont McKenna College, where I have taught for many years. I began my talk that night by quoting a few lines from a book of poetry called Pictures of the Gone World. Its author, a favorite poet of mine, is Lawrence Ferlinghetti. And the lines I quoted from him sound like this. The world is a beautiful place to be born into if you don't mind happiness not always being so very much fun. If you don't mind a touch of hell now and then, just when everything is fine. Twelve hours after I had finished my talk, which I called Take Nothing Good for Granted, terrorists had turned hijacked jetliners into missiles that leveled the World Trade Center in New York City. Lawrence Ferlinghetti got it right. In spite of the folly and corruption that, as he says, our fool flesh is heir to, in spite of 9-11, in spite of Palestinian and Israeli bloodshed, and even in spite of that unprecedented and unique catastrophe that we call the Holocaust, the world can still be a beautiful place. Not perfectly so, for the world is forever scarred, but beautiful nevertheless. <coughs> taking nothing for granted, and especially taking nothing good for granted, will be essential to make and keep the world that way. For that reason, as the screaming sirens and silences, and perhaps even the words of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust commemoration, remind us, it remains vital, urgent even, to remember the Holocaust, and especially in the Christian world. I'd be happy to take any questions you have uh, in the audience. We'll start over here. Do you think personally that this could happen again, or let's say, substitute the uh, Jewish for Muslim? At the Holocaust commemoration in Claremont earlier this week, uh, the speaker what happened to be another philosopher. Uh, his name is Beryl Lang. And uh, he would say uh, something a little different from what I said. I, I would say that a key lesson from the Holocaust is to take nothing for granted, and especially to take nothing good for granted. Uh, Beryl Lang says that perhaps the most important lesson about the Holocaust is that the Holocaust happened. Now, what he means by that is that this was an event that was not predetermined to be. It wasn't something that necessity produced. It was, it was what we would call uh, philosophically a contingent event. It, it had causes that produced it, but uh, it didn't have to happen. And if people had made different choices, if traditions had operated differently, uh, it not only needn't have happened, but it wouldn't have happened. But it did happen. And so he draws from this uh, basic point that, that uh, he underscores, namely that the key thing to remember about the Holocaust is simply that it happened. Uh, he draws from this the idea that it can happen again. 
there's no reason to think it couldn't. Now, it, of course, is an indefinite pronoun here uh, that wouldn't suggest uh, in his mind, or probably in any of ours, an exact repetition of history. But the notion that, uh, that something very much like this, where perhaps even an entire people might be uh, targeted for annihilation, is something that we ought not to take for granted as an impossibility. Now, where might it happen if it could happen again? Well, one of the things that uh, we, we know is that uh, versions of genocide have taken place with some regularity since the Holocaust happened. I'm working right now on a, on a project, a book uh, that several of, of my colleagues and I are working on that has a title that's a, a tough question. The title is, Will Genocide Ever End? And a part of this book is a kind of timeline, a chronology. Um, and one of the really discouraging parts of just looking at the 20th century and on into the early years of the 21st is to see how much genocide or ethnic cleansing or mass murder there has been since the Holocaust took place. We live in a, uh, an age of genocide, as, as some people have said. Could it, could it uh, take place in the uh, volatility of the Middle East? I think it's, it's certainly premature and, uh, and wrong to say, uh, of course, yes, it's going to or it will. But uh, we should take nothing for granted. And that's why it's so important that a, a resolution, a cessation of the violence there uh, should be found. Uh, things we know can go from one thing to another, and since disasters have happened once and they are contingent, uh, they can happen again. Yes? question that I don't think has uh, uh, a simple answer. Uh, there are ambiguities that attach to the very concept of uniqueness when we're talking about a historical event. Uh, as Jonathan Glover, uh, who's written a very interesting book called Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century, puts it. He says, you know, uh, every event is unique, and, and uh, yet there are ways in which events aren't. It's, it's, a, it's a hard concept to put into play. Some people prefer to uh, speak about the Holocaust as an unprecedented event. Um, I use the word unique in my talk, both unprecedented and unique. I, I believe that, uh, that a comparative study does indicate that uh, something that has never happened before and has not uh, not happened again in quite the same way did take place in the Holocaust. And the way I would gloss that or, or try to justify that claim would be by talking about the, the intention that was operative here, along with some of the mechanisms that were used for it. I think the Nazi intention was literally to destroy root and branch uh, everything Jewish in the world. This had no territorial boundaries attached to it, and it was not simply about destroying the lives of people, but it was about destroying the tradition. Um, th this is evidenced in some way by the, um, the massive destruction of uh, Jewish places of worship, Torah scrolls. Um, the, I, I think it was, it was the intention to destroy root and branch Jewish life and Jewish tradition. Uh, this, is, this is unprecedented, I think, and perhaps unique when you think of it in those ways. Now, we, we have to study uh, all of these events comparatively. 
however. There's nothing kind of a priori or just self-evidently about looking at the one thing that you know, tells you it's this, that, or the other. So the comparative study of uh, genocide is, I think, increasingly important and increasingly instructive because we see, we see differences uh, and similarities in, the, in, in this study. And above all, the reason we engage in this activity at all, I believe, I mean, the, the, the history has its own reasons, of course, just for studying things uh, as, as history for, for their own sake. But I think that we study these things also for ethical and political reasons. We're looking to see uh, how human beings behave, uh, what might be done to uh, intercede, intervene, prevent, check, correct the uh, massively destructive character that has emerged. Um, there is, I think, what uh, my, my friend Beryl Lang would call a history of evil. And we have developed as a species into a really lethal uh, form of life on Earth. And so the challenge that uh, the comparative study of genocide poses is just huge and immense. And uh, whether it will ever end is, is an open question, but a very important one. And memory is important in this because if we, if we forget what has happened, that says something very profound about our humanity. And if we are uh, so indifferent that we forget and, re and do not study these things and, and try to uh, see what, what the study can produce in the way of ethical and political motivation and initiative, then it's a really sad and tragic comment about our human condition. Mm -hmm. yeah, um Mikey, let me make a complimentary um, comment. I'm concerned about Christians. Uh, there's, a, there's a precept in the Talmud which just really affirms the common sense notion. In the long run, in the long run, I mean, the, the, uh, the persecutor is in much worse shape than the victim. It's better to be the victim. And so what I'm saying is, like, philosophically, um, the problem I have, and I think that there's pretty much a historical consensus now on uh, the 2,000 year all practically unending persecution of Jews vis-a-vis -vis Christian doctrine and Christianity. Um, and it did set at least the grounds for the Holocaust, if not actually the cause. Um, but um, I think uh, my problem is, um, and initially, one reason for the rejection of this theological direction in the Jewish audience was that that particular um, dogmatic universalism is, is, was clearly a dangerous direction. And as you probably know, there have been many attempted pseudo would be Jewish messiahs. There's a whole line of them. And somehow they've all come to, I mean, that history proves it. I mean, there hasn't been a single one, hasn't even led others to suicide, push, I mean, bad disaster. So, briefly, what I'm saying is, um, uh, in, 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 there's a metaphor in the New Testament itself that goes on and on the tree and the fruit. You shall know the good tree by the good fruit, the bad tree by the bad fruit. Um, religious. Individuals transcend all over the place without religious systems. The purpose of religion, in a certain sense, is to teach the masses. In line with this long-term fruit of Christianity, doesn't this impugn Christianity in its very purpose? In short, I mean, don't Christians, I mean, in, as individuals are largely good people, but don't they need now to get to salvation by crucifying the church itself and history? I mean, you know, that's, that's my question. How does, that, how does that still go on? Basically. Well, I want to go back to one of your early comments. Uh, uh, you said you thought that the victim comes out better than the persecutor. Uh, I'm not sure that it's quite that clear or simple. I, I think victims have, you know, serious problems in, in their victimhood. Long term. Long term. Okay, but. It hurts it immediately, but ultimately, looking back, I mean, the worst is the consciousness of guilt. Right. The bad news will be had on the The point I'm wanting to make is that I think we want to we want to try to live in a way so that uh, the world does not have victims. 
uh, because there's no uh, nothing good intrinsically about being a victim. You might you know come out better in the end. So so how how do you uh, deal with that? in a world where, and here I'll make a factual claim, where religious traditions are not going to go away. Um, you know, there have been scholars uh, who, who hoped for and, and even predicted that religion would wither and, and disappear. Um, I doubt that that's going to happen. So uh, when you talk about uh, the crucifixion of Christianity, if that would mean the disappearance of Christianity, I don't think that's going to happen. So the issue then is, and I think this is true of, of all religious traditions, that the, the challenge and the task is to make of them the best that, that one can, that we can. Uh, and post-Holocaust Christianity has a huge problem on its hands. We, we know this because the, the chickens have come home to roost, in effect. I mean, it, it, the tragedy is that it took the Holocaust to kind of sober up Christian minds and hearts um, and to see the, the dangers of what I, I referred to in my talk as triumphalism, or we might use a, another word, the notion that one religion supersedes another, replaces the other one, is more true than the other. Um, this has huge dangers in it. Uh, you're quite right about that. And, and we, we see in the world today, uh, wherever religion gets uh, linked up and, and becomes a, a seedbed for what we could call fanaticism, this is, this is lethal stuff. So you have to, in a way, I think, yes, you're right, your image of uh, the, no the crucifixion of Christianity itself is, is perhaps an apt one if it means that Christianity has to endure uh, a kind of passion narrative with respect to itself in trying to find out you know, what it can and should be. Uh, in the aftermath. So that's, I think, where there actually is some hope for this uh, tradition, which has, and I, this has to be said, I think, has meant a great deal to a lot of people because it has actually been experienced as something good. I know it has not been good for Jews. That's the, that's the catastrophe. And it hasn't been good for a lot of other people, too. But it, it has produced good things, and there's no reason why it can't continue to do that. But it will be better able to do that if it can find a way after the Holocaust now to substantially reform itself. And there are some signs of this, I think. I think uh, Christian uh, activity, Christian thinking, insofar as it has been touched by the Holocaust, is much more humble. It is much more attuned to uh, what I would call solidarity with the Jewish people, with, uh, with, with the Jewish tradition, even with Israel. Although I think Jews and, and, and many people, and Christians included, are, are, are hurting right now about what's happening in the Middle East in you know, various ways. How could we not be? This is, this is itself a, a, a disaster uh, in the making, perhaps, if we can't find ways to you know, turn it around. So that's how I'd answer. I'd, I would accept with you know, some modification your image that uh, Christianity has to undergo its own the crucifixion of itself in order to you know, become what it should be. Where are we here? Okay. I was just going to say an observation of the question. Sure. Observation is I don't know as you can, I don't think it's fair to attack a religion or attack a belief from what, based upon what a few pathological people do or even several thousand pathological people do, because it, in nowhere have I seen in the, New, in the New Testament this sort of thing to defend it. And the whole basic doctrine is Christ died for all of us, not, uh, he wasn't killed by a bunch of Jews, he died for all of us. Uh, I guess the one thing that I would ask is, is there something particular about the Jews that would have caused them to have been persecuted or were they the wrong, just in the wrong place at the wrong time? The, this thing about Christ killer, that's kind of a, that, that's an excuse for being a bully. That's an excuse for picking on people. I mean, you could say the same thing about the Italians because the Romans have a little something to do with the crucifixion too. Yes. Well, you're... Your question is loaded. 
uh, with a lot and uh, we should see if we can unload a little here. Um, let, I, I don't know that I can respond to everything that you said, but I'll, but I'll, but I'll, try, a few, I'll try a few things. Um, first, I think if one carefully reads the uh, New Testament, particularly the Gospels, through the, through the eyes of, of uh, Holocaust awareness, one can see that in these texts there is there's a quarrel going on a quarrel going on between uh, people who are convinced that uh, Jesus is the Messiah of God and those who don't see him that way and at times in these texts there are statements some of them attributed directly to Jesus that have a kind of hostility in them toward, well, toward some Jews at, at the very least. Historically, we know that these words had consequences and they contributed to what scholars would call a tradition of anti-Judaism that was part and parcel of Christian teaching and history. And when Christianity became uh, the state religion of the Roman Empire and then uh, morphed itself beyond that into the dominant kind of uh, religious element in the culture of Europe, uh, this baggage was carried along with it. It wasn't, and, and this is really important, it wasn't pathological people who did this or who thought this way. This became kind of part and parcel of normal consciousness in European Christian civilization. That Jews were somehow people who had kind of missed the truth. They had uh, not seen the light. Christian teaching about them held out the hope that they might. And therefore, uh, though there were episodes of violence that would break out from time to time, there was always something in the Christian tradition that would put the brakes on, that would say Jews too could understand what Christians rightly understand, namely that Jesus is the Messiah. There wasn't a total loss of sight that Jesus was a Jew, but it wasn't the kind of predominant thing that got carried on. And so it's this mixture, I think, that we see. Christianity, as it, as it developed and unfolded, I would say, did many good things. One of the things that it did that was not good was the way in which it kept envisioning the Jew as the other, as the one who was kind of the outsider, who more than that was regarded as the counter testimony to the truth. See, the Jew, even today, and this is important for Christians to understand, when, when you and I meet each other, and I meet you as Christian, you, you remind me that you know my tradition and my belief is contingent. It isn't self-evident. It isn't obvious. It, it may even be false. Even though it means a great deal to me. So one of the things that, that difference does for us, if we allow it, is that in a good way, it can keep our own traditions from becoming dogmatic, authoritarian, exclusivistic, dogmatic. It can help us to be more human in our spiritual life and in our spiritual commitments. And this, I think, is, 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 is maybe where uh, after the Holocaust, at least some people in the Christian tradition are finding themselves. Now, I, I have to speak about one other thing, and that is your uh, 
your kind of loaded question about, uh, well, did the Jews do something that really sort of made it natural that they would be? No, I wasn't saying that did they do something. Is there something particular that causes this? Okay. And, I'm not, and saying they did something okay. means, would indicate blame. I'm not indicating blame. Yeah. I'm saying is there something particular that, that would cause it, or were they just yeah. in the wrong place at the wrong time? If there hadn't been okay. Jews, would it have been some other group. Okay, now I'm going to answer your, your question by saying, by saying yes. There is something that explains this. And, and what I will go on to say is that the thing that explains the yes is that Jews are different. They, they have tended to be uh, every place always in the world except in Israel now and in ancient times a minority and and more than that they have been a minority that on the whole doesn't assimilate completely I mean a lot of Jews do they you know they decide that well the religion doesn't mean that much to them maybe the culture doesn't but be, partly because of, of the importance of memory um, Jews choose to be different even though this sometimes and maybe even often puts them in a situation where they are forced to pay the price of being different so yes there is something that explains this but it, it's not it's not that the uh, that the Jew is at fault for being different or that the Jew should be blamed, as you know, it's not that. It's the, the, the question comes back to why is it that those of us who are in the minority, or, 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 sorry, those of us who are in the majority have such a low tolerance for those who are different? Now maybe it's because we think that they're really just wrong, and being wrong is, is so dangerous that it ultimately can only be tolerated if there if the people who who act and think that way are what ghettoized see the nazis thought that the that the jew was so wrong not just in terms of belief but in terms of blood that at the end of the day the only way to solve that problem was by a final solution so this is this is the this is the, Part of the drama and the tragedy and the question of, of human history. How well are human beings able to tolerate difference? And all the ambiguity that that entails. Well, history would say not very well. But history's not over quite yet. And maybe we can end on this note. Lawrence Ferlinghetti still says, you know, the world can be a beautiful place if you don't mind a touch of hell now and then. And if you uh, can live in a place where happiness is not always so very much fun. But it still can be a beautiful place. And maybe that's partly why we remember the Holocaust. Thank you, and thank you all for coming this evening.